All right. Hey, good evening, students. I greet you in the precious name of Jesus. Um, many of our um, enrollments, they've indicated that they are having load sharing. Um, as you know, I don't call it load shedding. I, say, I always say it's load sharing because we are sharing the load of somebody else. Nevertheless, I think it's a Christian thing. This is something, you know, it's load sharing. So um, before we start, I want to pray, and I've got a special guest with me tonight, uh, Pastor Yaku Linde. He's also the fraternal leader for the chaplains on the bikes, not bicycles, on the bikes, you know. He's going to do the first uh, class for tonight, the domestic violence chaplaincy. Um, so, so yes, he's going to do that. But before I give over to him, I would just like to read a few verses from the book of Romans 12. And you know it by heart by now. Um, in, in, if you're not in class right now, but also later, if you listen to this, it says here in Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. Now, um, it's very clear that the Bible is giving us some good directions as to how we should treat our fellow brother and sister. It doesn't stop there. It says, not lacking behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, pers persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Isn't that beautiful? That we as chaplains can play such an important role in us to, you know, uplift the spirit of people in our world. And I hope that God will bless you also as you sit in this class today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you for this moment and we pray, oh God, that you will bless us. And even as Yaku will be giving us this class um, in domestic violence, my prayer is, Lord, that you will bless his mouth in the name of Jesus. All the other chaplains that may or may not be here tonight, our prayer is, Lord God, that you will bless them. And even as, as our country are really struggling with this load shedding, my prayer is, Lord, that you will help us, that there will be you know, in a position to, 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 to give adequate electricity to this, to, to this whole country in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for every other student that, that's enrolled in this course. My prayer is also that you will bless their ministries in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, okay. Welcome. Hey, <laughs> I say good evening all. Um, yeah, I'm Afrikaans, so you know um, Afrikaans people's English is like eight time. It just runs out. So if it does run out, please excuse me. Well, for tonight we're starting with domestic violence. Um, it's in your manuals on page 27. We'll start by. Um, Oh, let's start by the definition. Domestic abuse, pattern of abusive behavior in a relationship that is used to gain or maintain power and control over another person, whether it's male or female, an adult, a child, etc. It is manifested as physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological. This includes Actions that frighten, intimidate, terrorize, manipulate, hurt, humiliate, blame, injure, or wound others. We're going to look at some statistics, um, and you can read all of these statistics on several internet websites. Um, the basics we've got here in America, 4 million women, women are abused annually at a cost of over $5 billion. Over 1,000 women are killed annually by intimate partners. One in five female high school students report physical or sexual abuse by a dating partner. 94% of perpetrators are male. Over 1,500 children are killed by abuse annually in America, and over 50% is not reported. 81% of child abuse fatalities are younger than four years, and 75% of abuse takes place in the home. 
we're moving now to the power and the control wheel. And you can see the, um, the uh, physical and sexual sides. And then understanding the power and control wheel <clears throat> using coercion and threats, not a two way street, but normally one way street, where the abuser makes it his way, the only way. Coercive control is a form of domestic abuse or intimate partner violence. It describes a pattern of behaviors of perpetrator users to gain control and power by eroding a person's anatomy and self-esteem. This can include acts of intimidation, threats, and humiliation. Using intimidation to control through looks, actions, gestures, um, smashing things, destroying uh, property, or even displaying weapons. Using emotional abuse, putting her down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy, playing mind games with the other person, humiliating them, and making her feel guilty for things she has done or not done. In using isolation, controlling what she does, who she sees, who she talks to, what she reads, where she goes, limiting uh, outside involvement. We see that uh, a lot of people take away cell phones. You're not al allowed to contact anyone. Or if you do contact, what are you saying? What are you talking about? Then minimizing, denying, and blaming. Not taking someone serious. Saying the abuse didn't happen. Then using a children. Um, passes messages to her via the children and making her feel guilty about her affections towards the children. Then using male privilege, treating her like a slave or a servant, acting like the master of the class. No one else counts, only him. And then using econo economy abuse or economical abuse, preventing her from getting or keeping a job, making her ask for money, giving her an allowance, or taking her money. Here's some more statistics of South Africa. Um, one in every four women is a victim of domestic violence. A woman is killed every six hours by an intimate partner. 57 people are killed per day. Murders in the last year, uh, 2,930 women, 985 children. Cases reported, 20,336. And then there was a 6.9% increase from the previous year. More than one in four girls experience sexual violence in most countries surveyed. As you can see on this slide, the, the purple color is sexual violence as a child reported by girls. And then the, uh, the green by boys, Swaziland, was, the survey was only done um, with girls. And then you can see the, the statistics, 33%, 38% sexual violence reported. Okay, if you see that screen. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I believe you did not see the screen. Uh, there the screen is shared. As I said, you can see um, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Kenya. I mean, all these figures, above 30% sexual violence reported. We, I believe, as parents, we all believe and want this to be zero reported. Nothing like this happening to our children. <clears throat> then the next slide, um, circumstances leading to murder in South Africa. And then obviously policing alone won't stop South African violence. Everyone needs to get involved and to help and assist to uh, stop murder and violence yeah. in South Africa. There you can see, um, 50% was arguments and misunderstandings, 19% um, gang related, 
18% domestic violence, 14% mob justice or vigilantism, armed robbery is 13%, taxi violence 5%, um, 1% illegal mining. Me and uh, Pastor Monet had a discussion. We sure this figure has increased in the last year. And then political related violence is also the involved. Now, most the next okay, sorry, the situations often beyond police control. That is arguments and misunderstandings and domestic violence. That's where we, as individuals, as chaplains, as pastors, and as neighbors, can make a difference because we are there, we can get involved, we can assist and help prevent these situations. Okay. Apart from horrifying rape statistics, the surprising finding was that 2.6% of white women and 2% of black women believed men might beat women. The rape of South African women is among the highest in the world, according to a statistic South Africa report released yesterday. A total of 250 out of every 100,000 women were victims of sexual offenses, compared to 120 out of 100,000 men, the 2016-17 victim of crime report stated. Using the 2016-17 South African Police Service statistics, in which 80% of the reported sexual offenses, offenses were raped, together with the stats SA estimate of 68.5% of the sexual offenses victims were, were women. We obtained a crude estimate of the number of women raped right per 100,000 as 138. This figure is among the highest in the world. While the murder rate of both men and women declined steadily between 2000 and 2015, the murder rate for women increased drastically by 117% between 2015 and 2016-17, stats essay noted with concern. The murder rate for men, though still higher than okay. that of women, continued to decline between 2015, 2016-17. Okay. The number of women who experienced sexual offenses also jumped from 31,665 in 2015-16, psychological and emotional trap. Step three, introduce threat and see how she, she acts or reacts. One out of three women experience the same kind of abuse that you may experience. Can't leave because they know more. They will, they will make you die, they will kill you. Step four, kill her. Why don't I say that? Because I don't know what I was be, that I was being abused. Abuse only thrives in silence. Domestic violence, dysfunctional family indicators versus functional family indicators. As you can see in these columns, um, performance oriented dysfunctional family, that will be someone that will say, uh, that will only give appreciation when a child performs well, let's say in rugby or in cricket, and then they will get love and they will get um, attention. Whereas in a functional family, uh, it will be personal in orientated. It's not about the winning, it's about how you play the game well done, um, that you enjoy it. conformity demanded, versus diversity is welcome. Um, I, you, we're all different. We need to embrace the diversity of all people and all the members of the family. Then dependent or codependent versus interdependent, critical and judgmental environment versus accepting and trusting environment, inconsistent and rigid rules, flexible rules versus flexible rules. We need to be flexible in our rules. Not all people are the same, not all circumstances, nothing stays the same, and we need to be flexible. Um, in a dysfunctional family, there's many taboo subjects, and in a functional, all subjects are open for discussion. We need to be able to talk about any subject coming up. 
protective and of protective of secrets. And in a functional family, we open and honest in our disclosure. Uh, dysfunctional family will have certain feelings will be unacceptable. Um, with Afrikaans people, as we grew up, boys were not allowed to, to cry. Um, they always said, men don't cry, a real man don't cry. And that's unacceptable. We need all our feelings to be acceptable. We need to talk about our feelings and show this, our feelings. Punishment is shame and guilt producing, guilt producing. And in a functional family, discipline is a responsibility producing. In a dysfunctional family, there will be unclear boundaries. And in a functional family, we will have clear set boundaries. Our next slide, and this one you need to remember, this will be in the test, um, the cycle of violence. Now we lost it. Um, the cycle of violence will start always with the status quo, where there will be uh, a peaceful time and no arguments, nothing funny going on there. And that will move into the tension building stage, where tension will start blow, building up and building up, and then we will get to the explosive outburst where there's the fight, the argument, and then there will be a, a period or a time that we will talk about it and ask uh, for forgiveness, and that will be the honeymoon state. And then we'll move to the status quo and the circle will go again. Um, there's a video we'll be watching just now. Explain the domestic violence cycle, but I need four volunteers to help me and assist me to explain to you how the violence cycle works and uh, you know what, what happens in a regular home like this um, when we see the domestic violence cycle. So we've got here in, on my right hand side, we've got John Ray, you'll be the father, the future is of this one over there, my daughter, and uh, she'll be playing the mommy for now, and then we've got Yana over there, the other one, and she'll be playing one of the kids, the oldest kids, and Vicky over here, she'll be playing the and then also, also the talk um, in the front of school. Uh, so, yes, thank you for taking part in this exercise. So, so John Ray, the daddy, is coming home, coming late, that mommy is on his case because he was late again, like always, and, and she's just hoping and groaning and she's like, stop, and daddy becomes abusive for his mouth. And stop, and he blows out, he blows out, and, 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 he, and he just goes at it, you know, and, and the family is getting panicky, the children is getting frustrated, the children, they, they feel frightened, mommy feels frightened, and the mommy, and then she's decided, she, she'll just, oh, I want the gun now, but she just pops the balloon, and she takes force of panic up down, on her, it's on fault in the family, you know, we'll, we'll see this on a regular, on a regular way, but anyhow, that, uh, they have a great fun, thank you very much for, for playing with me today, I'll just explain further,
for us in the blur. Uh, sorry, can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. The next slide, Child Abuse. Child Abuse Prevention Act of 1919, Public Law 100 to 94, defines child abuse as neglect, as the physical or mental injury, sexual abuse or exploitation, negligent treatment or malnutrition of a child, a person under the age of 18, by a person and the circumstances which indicate the child's health or welfare is harmed or threatened. Child Abuse Amendment Act of 1984 defines sexual abuse as the use, employment, persuasion, inducement, enticement, or coercion of any child to engage in or assist any other person to engage in any sexual explicit conduct for the purpose of producing any visual depiction of such conduct, rape, molestation, prostitution, or other forms of sexual exploitation of children or incest with children. The four types of child abuse, physical child abuse. We'll discuss these four individually. Um, physical child abuse, the physical indicators, um, unexplained bruises, unexplained burns, unexplained fractures, unexplained lacerations and abrasions, human bite marks, and then the behavioral indicators they will be wary of physical contact with adults. They become apprehensive when other children cry. They demonstrate extremes in behavior. They are fearful and they experience nightmares. Sexual child abuse includes these acts with a child, fondling genitals, intercourse, incest, for the ones that don't know incest, that is, uh, we call it in Afrikaans, blutskander, that is sexual intercourse between blood relatives, then obviously rape, sodomy, exhibitionism, and sexual exploitation. The physical indicators, if someone is sexually abused, difficulty in walking, sitting, they will have torn, stained, or bloody underclothing, bruises or bleeding in external genital, vaginal, and anal areas, uh, venereal disease, particularly in children under 13, pregnancy, especially in early adolescence, frequent urinary or yeast infections, frequent unexplained sore throats, the behavioral indicators, the child will appear withdrawn or engages in fantasy or in infantile behaviors, they will have poor relationships, unwilling to change clothes or gym clothes, or participate in physical activities, engage in delinquent acts or runs away, display bizarre, sophisticated, or unusual sexual knowledge or behavior. Mental in injury of a child, <clears throat> physical actions by caretakers, habitual scapegoating, belittling or rejecting treatment, constantly treat, treating siblings unequally, persistent lack of concern by the caretaker for child's welfare, behavioral indicators will be habit disorders, conduct disorders, neurotic disorders, psychoneurotic disorders, behavior extremes, lags in physical and or intellectual development, and attempted suicide. Child neglect, <coughs> physical neglect, that is, includes a refusal of or delay in seeking health care, abandonment, expulsions from home, not allowing a runaway child to return home, inadequate supervision. The educational neglect includes the mission of chronic truancy, failure to enroll a child of mandatory school age, inattention to special education needs. Emotional neglect includes chronic or extreme spousal abuse in the child's presence the mission of drug or alcohol use by a child, and refusal of or failure to provide needed psychological care. <clears throat> child neglect, um, physical indicators, constant hunger, poor hygiene or inappropriate clothing, consistent lack of supervision, constant fatigue or listless, list, listless, unattended physical problems, or medical needs such as untreated or infected wounds. Behavioral indicators, 
begging or stealing food, constantly falling asleep, rare attendance in school, coming to school very early and leaving very late, and engaging in delinquent acts. It's very important at this point also to distinguish between willful neglect and parents or caretakers failure to provide necessities of life because of poverty and cultural norms. In South Africa, in this economic state, we see more, not neglect, but people that are really struggling to look after their children and to, to feed them properly. Reporting child abuse and neglect. Always document your suspicions and all physical evidence. Be, be prepared to provide information. Reports can, can be made anonymously. When you report, you are immune or protected from civil and criminal liability. There are some uh, phone numbers on the screen. That's important to have the numbers and to know who to contact in case there's a child abuse and it needs to be reported. Important for the chaplain to have these following resources. We need to know where the shelters are, where we can send people, um, women that's been abused, children that's been abused, or even men that's been abused. Uh, crisis centers, we need to be aware of the crisis centers, have um, contact numbers for them. These are all resources we can use in our, in our chaplaincy to assist the people. We need to know the victim witness program and pro-arrest policies and then also orders of protection. Any questions at this stage? Um, if you've got a question, you can just raise your hand. Okay. You know, no questions. Let's take a five minute break. Let's be back on the clock about um, quality, latest quality rank. Okay. Thank you.
correctional chaplaincy. Correctional chaplaincy. If you've got a passion for inmates, this is your time. All right. So, we, uh, yes, let's, let's, let's just move to page 36 and find our coursework there. Now, they say that the average prison inmate in America today, that's more or less our story also, is a 27, is, is 27 years old person, comes from either a broken home, 75% of inmates, or a home with little family of love. These people also had nine years of schooling, but only actually acquired grade seven education. Has very little vocational training and usually worked for a minimum wage, if at all. Now, prison is a place, um, and I'm, I'm all, Already not sharing my screen again. <laughs> Tonight is not screen sharing time. But a prison is a place of little hope, you see. And in some prisons, <clears throat> Dante's comment on hope applies when he says, all hope abandoned you entered here. Now, prison is a place where the, uh, the flame of light burns low. For, for some, it goes out completely. But for most, it's just flickering away. Sometimes it flashes brightly, but never ceases to burn as bright as it once burned before. Now, this is the stats in South Africa. What we see um, in, in, in this record, uh, we've got a record high of over 187,000 inmates in the year 24, but it declined and went up a little bit again. Um, in our statistics, taken from stats by, um, by Turning Point Ministries of the Church of God International Office, <clears throat> they say that the inmates, 60% of them did not finish high school. They also say 90% were abused as children. They also almost 50% used alcohol or drugs. And they said approximately 75% come from broken homes and 50% are functionally illiterate. Now, what is the CSC's identity? concerning correctional services at chaplaincy. <clears throat> now, personal identity as a representative of God, the chaplain is to foster a relationship between man and God. This is our job as chaplains to, 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 to bring a, a form of wellness in their spiritual lives. But you need to have an awareness of yourself as well as emotional stability. When, you know, do prison ministries because if you do not have that you'll have issues you'll have problems and people will easily you know mislead you by your good character and also you have to have a professional identity so these are the two identities you have to have personal identity and professional identity <clears throat> in a sense of uh, in, in regards to professional identity you'll have to be a trained in the religious profession like this or be able to handle difficult tasks and intensities of that very specific task, growing and practicing in the religious uh, profession, as well as remaining unbiased in ministry, as well as affiliate with professional chaplains organizations like the TIA, CSC, as you can see there at my back. So um, <clears throat> there's also different roles the chaplain may play and functions, and this is important for your test. There's different functions you may play as a chaplain, I mean, you've got the pastoral function. Uh, when you enter into prison ministries, they will see you as their pastor. Even though you may not even be a clergy person, you'll be their pastor. As well as, uh, because they won't ask your documents when you get in there. I'm reminded of a story. Like, um, a pastor once told us a very great story. And, and this, this old man, a farmer, he found the vet. And he told the vet that he must please come because... Um, you know, there's an uh, issue with his, with his one um, bull, you know, and, and, and this bull is ill. You know, so the, the, the vet came and, and he met up with the farmer and at the house. And as they walked down, they were supposed to go around a big camp site, you know, a big campsite where a wild bull is inside. Um, and, and, and the farmer said, let's walk around this camp, campsite, um, Doc. No, says the doctor, I, I have to, uh, you know, I can go through this um, short way to, to the other way, because, to the other side of this camp, because the, on the other side of this camp is <clears throat> a smaller camp where the sick bullies, you know, and, and the, doc, the, the farmer said, no, but please, doc, this, this bull inside of this bigger camp 
is very mad. He's, he's crazy for Bill. He's a crazy Bill. The doctor said, oh, no, man, don't worry. I've got papers. Oh, says the uncle, okay. And, and the farmer went around and he says, Bill, and the doctor, the vet went through the, the bigger camp. <clears throat> and, and later on, the farmer thought to himself, now, where is the uncle? Oh, where, is, where is the doc? So he went back and he, he saw the, the, the doctor was pointed, well, he was in a corner, kind of with this wild, wild animal, a bull, wanted to uh, kill him, you know. And, and all the farmer could say is, doctor, please show him your papers. <laughs> now, you know what, when you get into, you know, and a, a fulfilling role where you as a chaplain or a pastor or a reverend, whatever, you're, whatever you, are, you are, you know, um, if you're in, in that kind of fulfillment role where you, you, you speak to people's problems, they wouldn't ask you for papers because you're speaking their heart. You're helping them to get past from one season to the next. You'll also be their teacher. You'll teach them things they never knew before. The, uh, you'll teach them a language. You'll teach them love. You'll teach them the Bible. You teach them, you know, respect. You'll teach them the fundamentals of life itself. And that's amazing because you get the opportunity inside of prison to help people in that, in that way where you as a chaplain <clears throat> plays this important role in people's lives to, to pastor them, to, tra to also train them. And then also you can be the counselor. Now, people will see you as a counselor as soon as you speak to their problems, as soon as you speak to their hearts. And that's, that, that, that's good because they don't need this. So what is the three functions of the chaplain? Three roles, pastor, teacher, and counselor. Now, this is the Correctional Service Bible's Bill of Rights. And and the Bill of Rights says you've got the right to clean, decent surroundings, the right to maintain and reinforce the strengthening ties, the right to develop and maintain skills as a productive worker, the right to fair, impartial, and intelligent treatment, as well as the right to positive guidance, as well as counsel. Now, this is the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> now, for us as a prison um, prison uh, chaplains, prison ministry model, um, inmates have to never known God. You should understand that, that there will be some people that never heard about God. Even though everybody was supposed to know God, we, we expect everybody to know God. We expect everybody to know something about God. Now, the, the NIV says in Matthew 25, 45, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. So the Bible is indicating to us and telling us that we should do even prison ministries. Prison ministries are important. Um, remember those in prison, the Bible teaches, as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are uh, mistreated, as if you yourself were suffering, according to Hebrews 13.3. And that's the ministry of risk reconciliation. Why do chaplains go to prisons? To fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. To fulfill the dream of reconciliation because most of the inmates they've been um, you know they've been jailed for 30 years or 20 years they do not know how to get freedom you know from the past sins and you are there to help them to to to, to find the model of reconciliation through the blood of jesus our lord and savior now this is a person-centered ministry of jesus kind of ministry because jesus also went about doing good. And this is what prison ministry is all about. We try to go do good. He also brought the message of salvation to the people. He brought this message because he had this message inside of him. You cannot bring a message to people if you do not have this message inside of you. You'll need this message inside of you to bring it to them. You, you first have to study before you go and write an exam. In, in the same way, before you get involved in a type of a ministry model, you'll have to study this ministry model, pray about this ministry model, and ask the Lord to give you strength and to lead you into this ministry model and to open a door in front of you. The Lord opened himself that he might minister to these people also in their specific areas. Now, <clears throat> there are some characteristics of this ministry. Um, <clears throat> it's like in, being indiscriminate. You shouldn't discriminate when you go to the, to the, um, to the prison ministries and say, oh, I can see, mm, I can see. 
uh, no discrimination. Also, it's a limitless compassion. Now, now <laughs> in regards with this, I mean, to have a limitless compassion is actually the kind of compassion Jesus has and have over us. I mean, Jesus is also indiscriminate towards us. Even though I'm not in prison, <clears throat> but I've done so many sins in my life, but still Jesus loves me. He's got limitless compassion over me. And also non-condemnatory concern, the policy of not using force of, um, or threats even. So um, that's we, we do not use force or any threats. Uh, understanding tenderness. This is the kind of things we'll have to understand to be tender. And even if you're male, a chaplain or female, but males generally, they're not so tender as the female chaplains. But we should practice these skills to understand tenderness at least. And it's also about inexhaustible patience towards these people. Remember now, most of them, they're not um, schooled. You know, most of them have grade seven and below. Um, so you need to understand that, you know, you need to care for them. You have to be patient over them. You, you shouldn't treat them like children. Of course not, because they're adults. But you'll, you'll have to embrace them and, and be patient with them. Just give them a shot. Um, uh, deliberate non-coercion. Uh, you know, and also therapeutic optimism. You can, I mean, you can be optimistic in, in any way. Even if your car breaks down on your way, you can still be optimistic. The thing is, you'll have to make this choice if you're going to be optimistic or not. All right. It's like this guy, his car breaks down um, uh, along the freeway. And, and, and there's no house, just nothing at all. And he's got this can in his car. Um, <clears throat> he thought to himself, let's be go and find a, a farmhouse to see if a farmer can maybe help me by any chance with some fuel so that I can get to the next uh, filling station. So in the distance, he saw light on a farmhouse. So he was making his way to this house. And in his mind, he's, he's completely tormented because he's having this negative feeling about you know, this house is having this negative emotions running up and down because nobody will do any good to me. Nobody, you know, will, it, will bless me. Nobody will help me uh, and so on and so forth. And he's got, he, he became so negative when he knocked on the door at the farmhouse and the farmer opened and uh, the farmer asked him, hey, good evening, sir. What can I help you with? And the guy just responded and said, ah, but just keep your petrol. I don't want it. And he just turned around. They didn't even ask. <laughs> and that's what, uh, you know, we need to have learned optimism. We need to train ourselves to be optimistic to, through a therapeutic approach in helping our brain and retraining our brain, actually, to think positively. Because you know what's the problem with men and you, women? Um, you know, in our default position, we are negative beings. We are negative beings. And that's not supposed to be like that. <clears throat> We also have stresses of prison ministry. Uh, remember to stress the centrality of love when you visit the ministry of the prison. Uh, this is what it's about, is to stress Jesus' love. Stress the importance of inner attitude as wellspring um, of overt behavior. And also stress the need for faith rather than fear. Stress the need for um, altruism instead of egocentric, um, in, in, in egocentricity or selfishness, stress the need for understanding sympathy instead of legalistic censorship, stress the need for hum humility instead of unbending pride. These are the things we need to sh share uh, in prison ministry. And what about failure or dropouts? Uh, some enter to prison ministry without appropriate orientation. This is very important that the chaplain be orientated before getting involved in prison ministries. Some chaplains face situations never before um, even encountered in their ministry, in their lives. Some chaplains are focused on wrong motives when they enter into prison ministries. They want to be, you know, the, <clears throat> you know, the kid on the block or something like that. Um, there's some profiles about chaplains in, in, in prison ministries. Um, you may get this in your test, if you will. Um, I'm, I'll be happy about that if you know these seven points. But the first one is the ego tripper. <coughs> Excuse me. Nobody like me, the ego tripper says. I'm doing this great job of ministering to the incarcerated. 
So you feel, nobody likes me, Lord. Nobody likes me. And then all of a sudden, you become a chaplain in the, in the prison system. Then you say, then you say not nobody uh, likes me, Lord. Nobody like me, Lord. Nobody like me. And this is the problem. It's not about you. You know, to ego trip about this, is, in the first place, this ministry is not about you. Any ministry for that matter, no matter in what chaplaincy profile you are in, nothing, no ministry is about you. It's about Jesus. It's getting Jesus out there. Then the big rescuer kind of mentality. Um, the big rescuer, uh, listen and dress it with the warden or the head prisoner. You know, so for example, you listen to this guy and he tells you, listen, I'm not guilty. Now, everybody in jail is innocent. You know that? Um, even lending money out, being a big, big rescuer for people inside, you know, it's a problem. It creates problems for you in the, in the future. <clears throat> Don't think they will tell you, listen, I want to borrow money just this once. It will never stay that once. They will always remember you borrowed them last month. They will borrow again from you and again and again. <clears throat> then the zoo tripper. Going to jail out of curiosity. This is the type of person that's not as interested in sharing the love and grace of God as they, um, as he or she is in a satisfying their own curiosity. Because it's about them again. It's about their curiosity about what's going on in our jails. And then we've got the person seeking, seeker of rewards, the one who wants something, you know, who wants a badge, who wants a, a reward, a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, good job, chaplain. You're such a fine guy. And then we have the, um, excuse me, then we have the, I want to be different kind of person. I, I do not want to be a regular chaplain. I want to be a different kind of person. I want to be this fantastic in, individual who, who does chaplaincy ministry inside of the most dangerous places in the world. And I believe so. Um, Prisons isn't the most dangerous places in the world or in South Africa. There's much more dangerous places in the free world out there. Then we've got the self-gratifier. Again, it's about me. Listen now, chaplain. Everything about this chaplaincy profile, it shouldn't be about you and me. The first six is about you and me. But then number seven comes and it's about him. It's about God. It's about the people. And that's answering the call to be the true Chaplain, God is appointed. God wants you inside of the prisons. He wants you inside of the four walls to make a different, um, different unto him. <clears throat> now, you have to understand that you'll have to take a look at your own personal well-being also. <clears throat> because if your well-being is, you know, kind of down the dumps, the people inside, they've got some sense. They can figure it out just like that. And they will step on your toes just like that. Because they want control over you. And if you are suffering in one of these areas, they will gain control over that specific area. So be on the, on the watch for that. And that is the spiritual well-being. You need to take care of your spiritual well-being. Also your mental well-being. Read some books. Keep yourself busy, your mind busy, not only with negative social media or negative news. And also your physical, um, you know, your physical body. Take care of your physical body. You only have one physical body, take care of it. And also the professional um, well-being, your professional well-being needs to be taken care of also. There is four types of personnel inside of the um, um, correctional services. Now, um, it's the administration, the treatment people, as well as the security and the inmates. These are the four types of personnel you'll find inside of um, any prison. Now, administration, you'll find the wardens, the jailers, and the staff in there and the secretaries and record staff, the treatment people, counselors, chaplains like us, teachers, medical personnel. Did you know that in our local, you know, um, prison systems, they do not have full-time chaplains taking care of inmates. They have volunteer chaplains like you and me taking care of inmates. The chaplain, you know, appointed chaplain, they only take care of the administration as well as the security part. But the gender, volunteer chaplain takes care behind the walls and the trustees. <clears throat> so we also have to consider this as a way of ministering to the free world staff, the CSC, 
And once again, CSC stands for Community Services Chaplain, um, is to be vigilant with regard to security at all times. No lasting ministry can be done with the free world staff if the chaplain is known to violate or bend security rules and policies in their conduct. So it's important to know that security violation can cost an employee their job. So do not ask them to violate the security. Do not ask them to allow you in if they may not, because it can cost their jobs. If the CSC believes yourself above the duties and responsibilities of the staff, the chaplain will likely lose their privilege to minister in the first case inside of the prisons. Now, what to do in ministering to the inmate administrators and wardens recognize the contributions made by the chaplains, especially by the volunteer chaplains. Um, if religion is taken out of the prisons, inmates would return to society more embittered than before because what we train them is, is reconciliation. What we train them is to forgive them and put the past behind you. You know, it is religion which must give meaning to knowledge and vocational training at all, you know. Now, this is common to all denominations because when you minister inside of the prison system, you speak to many types of denominations present there. You'll, you'll have to understand a little bit of sacramental ministry. You'll have to understand about religious instructions. You'll have to understand about private and personal counseling ministries, as well as minister to inmates' family and related or concerned persons. And it's a broad spectrum denomination because there, um, there may not be a lot of full gospel people there. No, I'm just joking. Any case, <clears throat> what about anxiety and stress of the inst institutionalized person? Um, some, sometimes the inst institutionalized person may feel anxious and depressed and be in an anxious and depressed state. I mean, sexuality um, activities and fears inside of the um, prisons also causes a, a lot of stress on many men. Um, in, in jails, stress while waiting for an impending sentence. And, you know, um, I know people here in Rustenburg, they've been in prison four times, but never convicted. And every time when they get to jail, they stay there for three months, released, go back to jail, three months, four months, released, and every time for a different crime. So this happens, you know. <laughs> um, but, and then also pre-release anxiety, stress. many of the inmates, they will have a pre-release anxiety because they do not know what to expect outside. And then also blocking off all thought processes as well as going on this uh, bad guilt trip, you know. So what to do when you minister to the ex-con? Now, I know that many churches won't have a, a lot of ex-cons in, in their church, but I mean, there must be some people in your, in your um, area of residence uh, that may need some ministering too, and they are afraid to come to church because they do not know what to expect. Now, remember, perception of acceptance of this person is important, but, <clears throat> but you do not have to call out his name and, and in church, for example, in the in, in case of the church service, and say, hey, Brother Peter, we're so, back you're, uh, we're so happy you're back from your 15-year sentence. Praise the Lord that he made it only 10 years. No, that is not the type of welcoming for an ex-con in church. Unless the ex-con wants to witness and testify um, in front of the members, that's another story, but it's not your place in, in ministering in that type of way. And then also we'll, we'll have to have a neat, conscious environment for them. So what I would suggest is that you, uh, if, if you know you've got some two or three um, inmates and maybe there's some other inmates in the area, you can, you can start a support group for inmates and help them to, to, to recover and to stay intact and, and, you know, to leave the old life behind they, um, after, um, you know, they came out of prison. Then we've got developing a volunteer program. Make contact with the jail or the prison officials and meet um, with them personally concerning your ministry. <clears throat> you can have a personal relationship with, with the jail and official people working in there. Also bring a letter of introduction, just write something there, you know, and, and, and say you're a um, um, community services chaplain, you're registered with this board, and you would like to become a volunteer chaplain in the correctional services. 
And you know what's interesting? You may not know this, but um, you know, the Department of uh, Corrections, they're the only department paying their official volunteers. You know, you know their volunteers doing prison ministries. Um, they're not paying much. I, if memory serves correct, I, I cannot remember. I think it's about 280, 280 rands per visit. <clears throat> but nevertheless, that's not about money. Um, but, uh, well, of course, you, you also have um, volunteer chaplains in other departments like um, defense. They've got volunteer chaplains. Um, uh, yes, they've got volunteer chaplains. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you must work about eight hours or 24 hours, I can't remember precisely, um, per month so that you'll be, um, you know, uh, one of the uh, volunteer chaplains there. Now, so yes, bring a letter of reintroduction. It will be helpful. Then stress the ministry's connection with the local church. What is the connection with community service chaplain with local church and how do you bring this together because they would want to know because they, they put in the care of trust of people inside of here they put it they give you the, the key of the prison for that matter and then we've got adequately trained your volunteers so if you have a, a bunch of volunteers in your church and you want to let them do some prison ministries what should you do you should provide them with this training material you should help them to be the best chaplains out there okay so is there any questions? <clears throat> no questions. Come on. Going once, going twice. Uh, Pastor? Yes, place them. There was a few words that our speaker said to us, and he said, will this be a video? Um, wat wat jy in opraat van die slides? Ja. Yeah. Ja, yeah, that, that slides you missed in the front, in the, in the start of the lesson. That wasn't important. Don't worry about that. Okay. Bye, Donkey. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. No questions. All right. So I guess I'll see you on Tuesday. So remember now, Tuesday will be my last evening in person, like online. Then I'll just have a, a um, I'll have to, I'll need a couple of hours to travel on Thursday night. I'll be traveling to the US, but then I'll see you when I come back again online. Well, I, I, I'm also going to do some training over there, of course, um, I'll, but I'll complete this class with you um, when I'm abroad. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, glorify you in this evening. We want to thank you for helping us to look outside of the box, how we can help people, Lord how we can impact the world outside. I pray this, Lord God, that will bless us in this day, and that we will find the refuge in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, have a blessed evening, chaplains, and I hope your load shedding is not too evil in your life. Enjoy.